Let's see. There we go. Is it going? It says it is. It's now streaming live on Facebook. Mine says setting up your meeting. So let me just okay. check inside the group if it's up. Also pull this up for questions. Okay, we are live. Yay, it's always like such a lag wow. there. But hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for this episode of the Elevate Your Life and Business Expert live stream series. I'm super excited because today I have Lance on, who is a life and fitness coach for high achieving entrepreneurs. We're going to be talking all about elevating your success habits and so much more today. So thank you, Lance, so much for being here today. I'm really happy to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been exciting and uh, I've been like really looking forward to this for several weeks. Oh, yay. Yeah, so you guys, we're going to give so much value today and really um, take note of the things that hit home for you, because if you implement this, it can be huge in your life and it can be huge in your business. But I would love to just start out Lance by you sharing a little bit about you and, you know, your journey and also exactly what you do with people. Yeah. So, um, so I've been in the fitness industry for going on 15 years this year. And it all started with me, um, you know, whenever I was in middle school, I just severely struggled with uh, self-confidence, self-esteem. I was an academic, um, an artist, musician, and uh, I just, I had more of now what I know um, to be as more of a feminine energy. And it just, that was not something that I was comfortable with, <clears throat> you know, growing up. And so, you know, I'm seeing, you know, all of the other, you know, the boys, you know, playing sports and doing all of these things that are so much more kinesthetic. And it just wasn't my cup of tea. And uh, finally, I hit a point in which case I just felt like my rock bottom, in which case I just was so tired of feeling like I just wasn't myself, um, that I didn't have the confidence that I felt like I deserved. And then, you know, after, you know, seeing my dad, you know, being into lifting and being in shape and so on and so forth, I finally reached out to him and was like, okay, I don't know what this looks like, but you got to help me. And so he helped me and he did it in such a way that he helped me because he knew that I was so not into fitness. I was so not into this sort of like, um, even approach to getting more confidence because it just wasn't my way. And so he broke things down in such a way for me that made it so simplistic. He didn't allow me to just go, you know, just balls to the wall that I was trying to just because I was so desperate to get in better shape. And he actually kept me towards like, nope, you're just going to focus on very short workouts. This will, this is what we're doing. We're going to do this just two to three times a week. Let's just build a habit. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if you can enjoy it. Let's focus on some things. And his approach within, I had no idea that, you know, I started enjoying it. And uh, within about five or six months, um, you know, a, a family member ended up showing me a picture of me out in the pool and was like, wow, look at this, look at what you've done. Have you stopped and noticed? And I saw the picture and I couldn't, I, it, I barely recognized it. And I didn't realize over the course of that five or six months, not only had my physique changed so much, my confidence had grown so immensely that, you know, I spoke with people and was looking them in the eye again. And, you know, I felt like people started noticing like the positive features about me. And I, I was less nervous about them noticing things that I was self-conscious about. And uh, for me, that was like, that set a stage for me. And so through high school, I started studying and trying to understand a little bit more about exercise physiology and all this stuff. And I was so focused on the external and it was amazing. I started working with people. I became a personal trainer shortly after high school. And I was obsessed with learning everything, you know, from kinesiology and biomechanics and nutrition and all of this stuff. And what I learned over, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I had helped so many different people, but I didn't feel fulfilled, number one. And number two is I noticed that a lot of my clients had reached these really, really great um, makeovers that I call, I call them a makeover before I called them a transformation. And upon like really digging in deep, these were not transformations. These were temporary makeovers and not permanent transformations. And what I realized was that I had stuck with this. I had done really well. But one of my biggest issues is that I felt like finally, after looking in, I still felt dissatisfied. I still battled body dysmorphia and I changed my physique. And yet I still battled some of these areas of anxiety and overwhelm and just feeling like, why do I still battle some of this self-confidence stuff whenever I've gotten myself in such great shape and now I want more and 
I be, just started battling so much of the mindset. And so, um, you know, there was a brief point um, right after high school that I had looked into becoming a counseling psychologist. And it was kind of between personal training and that. And uh, so I started picking up my old love for the psychology, looking into neuroscience and understanding like what, why in the world are some of my clients not getting the results that last or they're not feeling fulfilled even though they've gotten this transformation. And why have I done this? What's happening? And upon deeper research, lots and lots of research and studying and learning, I started realizing that unfortunately, the fitness industry and myself, we were helping people to undo or to fix external problems. And these were just symptoms. These external problems were things that we noticed, but these were real things were actually internal problems. And we were only creating external solutions for internal problems. And so I had done well by changing some of the external symptoms. I had not done anything for my internal. And so once I started deep diving and understanding how do I change a habit? How do I find fulfillment versus just achievement? Why are people achieving great things and not feeling fulfilled? And that's what turned into where I started adapting and creating this process, in which case is a hybrid of life coaching and fitness coaching. So that's in a nutshell, kind of where my story and my path led to. <clears throat> wow. I love that. I, I love that you combine the emotions and the mind and fitness because they all really do go together. And as somebody who I recovered from an eating disorder as well, and <clears throat> I, I never realized that before, you know, when I was so focused on food and focused right. on body, I was like, you know, not even realizing that I wasn't fulfilled, not because of my body, but because of other things. So I Absolutely. love that you do that. And I'm sure your dad is super proud to see you like following in his footsteps. That's so cool that he yeah, like trained sure. you and helped you in yeah. the beginning. And that's amazing. <laughs> so you help, um, high achieving entrepreneurs. Is that who you help? Yeah. So high achieving entrepreneurs and specialists. So there's, I will, you know, a lot of people I work with are, you know, RNs or doctors and attorneys and things and singers and a lot of people that are, you know, that are specialists in their field, um, real estate agents, different things like that. But these are people that um, they don't just want good enough. They mm -hmm. don't want to just achieve great things. They want to make sure that, you know, not only are they achieving great things, but they feel fulfilled, purposeful, um, mm -hmm. and they want to be their best. And so, for them, they know that even though sometimes they'll say like, yeah, I want to look my best. And then they're like, I know that sounds vain. And I assure them like, hey, no, 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 it's not always vain just to want to look our best to have our outside reflect what we do the work on the inside. So, but yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's who I work with and help those people and overachievers dial it back down so that um, I have a firm belief that most um, overachievers or high achievers are usually uh, chasing perfectionism and achievement in order to feel some sort of fulfillment because there's either you know, a root somewhere in shame and perfectionism. And uh, so those are some things that we work on as well to kind of overcome those things and heal through that as well. <clears throat> so, which is really cool. Yeah, That's awesome. I know that for people who maybe aren't super high achievers or they haven't gotten to that place yet, it can, it, we can look up at, you know, celebrities and people who are doing really well and think, wow, these people have like amazing confidence they feel so good about themselves mm -hmm. but a lot of times like you're right it is so based on like how much they're earning how successful yep. they've been what their body looks like in such external things and I've actually had clients who that all gets taken away and right. they have to really learn how to feel worthy and how to feel good and yeah. how to feel confident from the inside so I love that and um one thing that you talk a lot about which is really cool is infusing pleasure into the process of achieving your yeah. goals, um, to have more success. So I'd love to dive into yeah. that. And yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it was, uh, probably about 12 or 13 years ago, whenever I first started really diving into like, you know, becoming a life coach and understanding like how, what motivates people. Um, why do some people reach these amazing goals that are Olympic size? And then some people just have a simple goal to just eat less and they, they're not able to do it. And, you know, sometimes it's going to come down to approach and things like that, as far as like, maybe the method wasn't right, so on and so forth. But oftentimes, though, people don't realize that these things that we're going to be motivated, you know, based on pleasure or pain. And I learned this about 12 or 13 years ago, the very first person I learned it from was actually Tony Robbins. And then whenever I started diving in and learning NLP and learning all of these different techniques and tactics and what have you over the years, I started diving in deeper to understand it more for myself. And 
what it really comes down to is that every decision that we make is going to be based on moving closer towards pleasure or further towards or further away from pain. And so usually what's happening is <clears throat> there is going to be a neuro association, or that's a fancy way of saying that we link more pain to what we want to get done. If we didn't, we would get it done. We would make that happen. And so there's a lot of different reasons for this, but usually what's happened is, is that somehow we've associated pain to getting in shape or to being in shape or to building a business, fill in the gap. And this here is where people never realize that they have these conflicting thoughts or conflicting goals or beliefs. One of these goals or one of these beliefs is that, you know, I deserve more. I want to be happy. I want to do this, that, or the other to get in shape, to own my business. But then they might have another belief that counteracts that one that says, you know, getting in shape is nearly impossible for me. You know, I've never been in shape. I probably could never be in shape. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things or like, well, you know, I want to be the seven figure earner, but I also have this belief that if you're, you know, if you've made X amount of money, then you must be evil and you're not focused on people's emotions. And so yes. when we have these beliefs like this, we we're unfortunately assigning more pain to reaching the goal than pleasure. And it's just like a scale. So whenever there is going to be more pain associated, even on a subconscious level, we're not going to make some sort of action to get out of what we perceive as our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So we have to be motivated enough, whether by to move you know, closer towards pleasure or out of that pain. So what I begin to do is to teach people to understand first is identify what areas are you associating more pain to things that you want. So if somebody is wanting to lose and they've got 80 pounds to lose, the very first thing that I want them to do is to come up with everything negative that they can come up with about getting in shape. You know, well, I have to work out hours on end. I have to this, that, and, the other. and these are all perceived values, you know, perceived beliefs, but they'll write all of these things down. And then what we do is we go through and we begin to dispel those number one. So we can kind of eliminate some based on logic. The other thing that we do is we can start writing down some good things, not about working out, but some pleasurable things that they'll get very on a very, very deep emotional level. And when they reach this goal, because I'm going to show them, I'm going to pull what's already in there. I'm going to pull that out, that pain, so that they can become a little bit more aware of how painful the situation that they're currently in really is, because we numb ourselves to it. Mm -hmm. So once we reveal the painful situation for what it is that, hey, this isn't just a minor situation that I'm carrying, like, you know, I don't want to be in the occasional photo. This is I'm in no family photos with my family because I'm so ashamed of how I look, or this is, I feel like I've worried that I've lost sales because I feel like the person on the other side of the table is judging me for my weight or how I look. These are things that are happening and people numb themselves to it by eating more, drinking, doing some sort of vice that helps them to numb or escape. And that prevents them from seeing what their current lifestyle, which they perceive or deem as comfortable is. So by showing that more of a mirror, and then showing them on top of that, helping them to determine the pleasurable things that they're going to get out, things that are fulfilling. You know, my spouse is going to look at me better. You know, some of these things are perceived, but it's just whatever we can draw that emotion up with, you know, that it's like, oh, I finally have the confidence to ask for a raise. You know, I would feel so much more confident that I wouldn't question whenever I walk in that people are judging me or, you know, it, on the business side of things that it would be oh man, you know, yeah, I know that it would be a lot of work to get there, but to have the utmost freedom to not be told what to do or to not bend my values for somebody that I work with to actually put that into my business. These are all huge whys or what we call underlying motivations. When that underlying motivation of the, the pleasure of the outcome begins to outweigh, which we can do just by neuro association or neuro associative conditioning, just by reassociating, mm -hmm. this now becomes so painful, this current lifestyle because we've seen it for what it is. And now this lifestyle becomes so pleasurable that we've now stacked the odds in our favor that we'll do anything to avoid pain, to move from this and anything to move closer to this displeasure. And all that came from was first identifying the reality of what things are. This is a process that I use and it's so effective that people begin to uproot things and go, wow, I have stayed here because on some level I made myself comfortable because I was ignoring all of the pain this life is costing. And on the other side of this, there's freedom, there's confidence, you know, there's a deeper belief in self, there's self-worthiness, so on and so forth. So that's the process that I use there. So it works really well. I love that. I know for me in the beginning of my journey, I, uh, I was like, well, I think these thoughts and these negative feelings about me are true. Like, how do I know they're not true? And one thing that I always like to say is like, nothing that feels good can actually be 
the truth of us. Mm -hmm. Like any thought, any feeling, any experience we're having, we're all, we're all born perfect. We're all born innately happy and abundant and free and healthy and all of these things, but things happen throughout our lives. Or if you believe in past lives, you know, that condition us differently. Mm -hmm. Um, so for those of you out there who are thinking, you know, maybe those negative things are true about me, right. it can't ever actually be true. And I love that you kind of explained the process of realizing the negative thoughts and realizing the negative feelings, mm. identifying them and changing them because it's true. We have to change our self concept and how we feel about ourselves that's before that's we that's actually that's have the change, which most people kind of usually think the opposite, right? Completely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, so go ahead. I um I always, you know, let people know that because people usually go, well, all these fitness coaches are talking about mindset, but what does that really mean? Is it just like focusing on this that or the other? And my question usually is is, you know, whenever we're talking about things is if you have a belief, you know, this is where I usually teach on thermostat and things like that, but if you have a belief about yourself that you're a C student and I help you to get A's, which is just, again, using this metaphor, this is the same thing that most fitness coaches or business coaches would do. They hire me as a tutor. I help them. They're a C student. I get them to an A. If we didn't do anything internal, if I didn't do anything to help them internally to see that they're not a C student, if they believe they're a C student, that A to them is because of me or that A is because of it's a fluke because they identify as a C student. So unfortunately, what most of the time happens is people identify as a quote C student or a bad business owner or an overweight person or whatever it is. And unfortunately, somebody helps them to get out of that position externally, and then they sink right back to it because they never truly got out of the belief that they deserved or that they were not who they believed they were before. And unfortunately, whatever you believe to be true about who you are or what you are, your actions will be completely congruent of that until we change both or one of those at least starting from there. So yeah, great point for sure. <clears throat> yes, that is so true. I know um, I've had clients and friends say things like, you know, I've, I've been skinny before I've hired a trainer, I've gotten fit or I have felt healthy and then it all like went back. So they, then they have this belief too, that like they can do it, but that it's always going to go back. Always and it, I know it's yep. really hard you guys to, take responsibility. Like, I think this is one of the hardest parts is being like, yeah, I've actually created everything in my life. Like, you know, not just fitness, but like, if there's chaos in your life, there's chaos inside of you and your mind and your feelings, like whatever is in your experience, we create that. And that is the, I think one of the hardest parts of this process is taking responsibility. Um, but Oh, Angela says, Oh my God, I love this. Hi, Angela. Yeah. Oh, and thanks. I want to share, I didn't say this in the, in the beginning, but you guys feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm sure Lance will be happy to oh, answer definitely. them, but, um, engage, share your thoughts, share your feelings, share what's coming up for you. Um, we love engaging with you and it just Completely. makes the conversation more aligned to what you're looking for and what you want to learn. Yeah. Um, but what would you say to somebody who's like, you know, I, it's always a cycle for me. Like I get fat and then I'm skinny and then fat and Definitely. I'm skinny and I need to like extreme diet in order to get skinny and they extreme diet. And then they like yo-yo back. Right. Yeah. So there's a couple different things is number one, there's a lot of approaches that people take. And then we create this identity based on the approach. So unfortunately what happens now, there's a physiological level here that I certainly believe. And I teach on, um, where people actually create what's known as metabolic adaptation, um, so people who it's not really difficult for people to diet and get into shape the first time or to diet and get down to weight. So if you ask most people, they don't have a weight loss problem. They have a keeping the weight off problem. And, and so these people usually believe that this is what happens. Unfortunately, there is a very, very, very unethical path that's being taught in my opinion, because most of these diets are created specifically to make money, create amazing transformation pictures, make more money sell more and get people just on the cycle that they lose, gain, lose, gain. And they never teach people like, Hey, you're actually going to keep on gaining this back over and over because of these things that you're doing with your body. With that being said that there are some ways that whenever people are dieting, they're immediately causing metabolic adaptation in which their metabolisms begin to adjust and acclimate in a nutshell, the, the body is perceiving that there is famine or scarcity of food and the body actually begins to, um, create these defensive prongs basically to fight off what it perceives as famine. 
when this happens, unfortunately, um, the metabolism begins to slow down for several different reasons, but it's doing this in order to conserve energy because it, it's a, afraid of starvation. And so nevertheless, this is what's happening, but people crash their metabolisms and then they go back to regular calories with the metabolisms that, that's decreased. So they gain fat quicker than what they lost it. Then they go and they diet again and their metabolism stays down and never gets raised back up because they don't know how to do it. And then they diet again, only this time they lose less because there's not enough of what's known as an energy gap between the, you know, what they consume and what they burn. They do this process over and over. And eventually what, you know, where they used to be able to lose, you know, lose weight at 1700 calories, they stop losing at 1500 and then 13. Then you, I've worked with people who have literally consumed a thousand calories and couldn't lose a pound because they've damaged their metabolism because they gave it a signal that, Hey, food is sparse, go ahead and slow down and conserve energy. So that's the physiological side of why that happens. But to go deeper, the main reason that people do this is they create this cycle because a lot of times people will feel just enough pain, um, just enough pain that they take immediate action. They take some sort of action based on just eliminating the pain rather than you know like the, 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 the sting or the pangs of the pain. And they try and eliminate it as quickly as possible and they get very, very overzealous in doing this because they'll do anything. Again, we do anything to move closer to pleasure or away from pain. Mm -hmm. So in this overzealousness, they you know, use a fad diet or they go crazy on cardio or working out. They do something so overzealous. Then all of a sudden they get a little bit of results, even though they've exhausted themselves, the pain level decreases. So now the, very, the one thing, because they didn't really get in touch with you know, reassigning pain and pleasure, the one thing that they feel that motivated them, that the sting of the pain has now dissipated because they've got just enough results. Now, this isn't going to be something that's going to stay with them and help them to stay happy um, because they set one goal. And this one goal was to feel better about themselves where they were at. And that's it. And unfortunately, they begin to decrease their effort because again, they were overzealous and they were over exhausting themselves. Mm -hmm. So now that the pain levels decreased, the motivation has decreased. And now man, you know, I had motivation to push myself like crazy before and overtrain. I don't now. So next thing you know, is that again, results begin to decrease, which causes motivation to wane even more. And then they stop. And then they mm -hmm. do this process again, because they regain it. They feel the pain again, just enough. They take action. They lose the pain. So, it, so this is over and over. Mm -hmm. And this is what people do. So if you don't stop and actually determine how dissatisfied you truly are and what you, you know, what this lifestyle looks like for you, this is where I teach a lot of times the difference between a goal and a goal system. A goal says that I want to, you know, lose 30 pounds. A goal system says, I'm going to go ahead and create this cycle, this process in which I work out or I'm active for 30 minutes and I track my food so that not only will I lose 30 pounds, but that I stay in shape. I know how to stay shape and I sustain this forever. And people don't think about that. The other way to say it is, somebody who is saving for a vacation, a goal says, I'm going to save $2,000 for this vacation. Whereas a goal system says, I'm going to save hundred dollars a month for the rest of my life. So I can not only go on this vacation, but go on vacations every year. That one usually resonates with people a little bit more, but that's what I teach so that people don't go on that pain cycle over and over. Yeah. That's a really good example. So the, would you say that all of this applies to everything? Like you, we were talking about it in terms of body, right? Correct. Would you say that the yo-yo type mentality kind of applies to business as 100%. well? A hundred percent. Everything that like, I make sure that this is why whenever I'm doing video content, I won't create things that are as specific to diet or to exercise physiology, because mm -hmm. I believe that again, I work with entrepreneurs. I want to help them not only achieve their goals, but to reach fulfillment. And there's such a huge difference between the two. And unfortunately, it's the same concept that people do this as well, that it's like, I hate my job. I want to get out of my job and I'm just going to start my own business. And so it's like, I'm going to start this business and they start this thing and then they lose sight very quickly of what it was that they wanted. And then the business fails or, you know, they go through that process in which case they didn't really map out things. They just wanted out of the bad situation. So, you know, they create a business that really wasn't based on passion or education and it wasn't really built on what would, you know, bring fulfillment. It was only like, screw this boss and screw this lifestyle and I'm out of this. And so it wasn't really built on like that really tying into the underlying motivation. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the same process and people wonder why, you know, they can't make it. Well, you didn't really put your heart into it because you didn't allow your heart to get into it. You just wanted the pain gone. And that's the big difference. <clears throat> this is such a good conversation. <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm having so it. much fun. <laughs> so 
Um, this leads really well into the next topic that I wanted to cover, which is why doing more is oh. not always the yeah. answer to better results. I know this applies to fitness. This applies Everything. to business. So what would you say? I know it's like a very broad thing, but like, what do you oh, yeah. want to say on this? <laughs> yeah. So, so again, I work with usually the, uh, the very classic high achiever or overachiever. And unfortunately, most of us, and I include myself in this, I still call myself a recovering perfectionist as well. I'm not recovered, I'm still recovering. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, whenever people are so overzealous and they're aiming for these, you know, that they're, you know, they think if some is good, more must be better. A lot of this is going to be based on the fact that they feel inadequate. They feel like they're simply not enough. It's a scarcity mindset. It's not based on the achievement in and of itself to get something done or to make the world a better place or to accomplish something. This is the one goal here. The one accomplishment is more entwined in making myself feel whole, complete, or finally less shame. And this is what chase, causes people to chase perfectionism. So we can't just work on just like overcoming the habit necessarily without focusing on the why, which is, you know, going to be rooted in, you know, again, a, a getting rid of this pain that I feel because I don't like this identity. And I feel like if I produce more, if I make more, if I you know, get just in the best shape ever, then maybe, maybe I'll feel complete. Maybe people will compliment or they won't notice this thing that I feel embarrassed or ashamed about. Mm. And so unfortunately, that's what happens is people do this and they begin focusing on, again, if I got some results here and it got me some good feedback, more must be better. And unfortunately, what ends up happening, and I know that, you know, using just the fitness realm is people oftentimes do this and they burn themselves out so quickly because they were trying to chase record-breaking scenarios in business, record-breaking scenarios in marketing or in their fitness. And what I see happen is the person who's constantly trying to have, like on a scale of one to 10, they're trying to have nines and tens and 11s on their business day, you know, or their fitness days or whatever it is. Unfortunately, they get so exhausted. It's kind of like, um, you know, I teach high intensity interval training as like a method for exercise. And the reason that works is because you can go high intensity and then you allow yourself to recover. High intensity, and allow yourself to recover. And this method would be so much better because it's balanced if people were to take that approach in life with their business. Okay, I'm gonna strategically plan on giving more effort for this week and then I'm gonna rest. I'm gonna strategically put in more effort for this band and then rest. But people don't feel like that's something that makes sense to them. So because again, they're operating on reaction. If I feel this whole and I must do all of these things so that I can feel better, about this because again you know action alleviates anxiety it doesn't rid it but it alleviates it and so more action more action you know the hope is that our anxiety dissipates unfortunately we're breaking ourselves down so what i see in the fitness industry is that most high achievers come to me and they're like all right lance is teaching to do three to five workouts his his clients are getting great results i'm going to do six or seven and he's teaching me that i can be flexible on this stuff what if i were more rigid what if i took this a different approach so people begin to almost modify what I teach. So because it's specifically based on their need huh. to get further. And unfortunately, these are the people who usually burn themselves out and crash and burn before they ever even see the results. So that's the big key is like, if you want sustainability, and I teach three things whenever it comes to, and I think this is probably effective even in business, but whenever you're setting a plan, when you're trying to determine if you can get in shape and stay in shape. The number one thing that I tell people is focus on if your plan is adherable. Can you keep good adherence when you're doing your plan? Same thing with your business approach. When you're talking about, I'm going to do this 90 day challenge for my business. And it basically means you get no sleep, no friends, no social life. And you're doing this for 90 days. Do you really think that on the other side of this, you're going to be able to maintain that business growth that you've got through those crazy methods? Probably not. You're going to be exhausted and you're going to have some resentment. So again, by focusing on a more systemized way, can I adhere to this long term? Number two, does it bring results? Is it effective? And then finally, number three, can I sustain those results once I've got them and still maintain my quality of life? If people aren't considering their quality of life and they're only considering getting out of pain, they're going to do some things that basically usually are going to lead to just really fast setbacks. And that's the unfortunate thing that I see so, so often. This is so cool. I love how it all is like interconnected, interconnected completely. like the body and work. And what I see a lot in business is people being driven by fear, fear oh, of failure, fear, fear of not making enough money. Um, right. And what I teach a lot is like, 
trusting your intuition. Like if you're not feeling good one day, like take a rest day and like actually in the not doing, and I, I know this, I guess applies to fitness as well. Like our bodies can heal. We can up level. We actually grow on a cellular level when we are resting. So we actually are doing, and I believe, and what I've seen is we actually move faster when we take time to rest and recharge. We're more effective Mm. when we trust the intuitive guidance and the more aligned guidance is you're talking about. We have better results because we're doing the things that are actually more impactful Mm -hmm. instead of doing a million things and hoping that one of them like works out or does something. That's it. And Jim Rohn had a book that he talked about, like how, like there are seasons in life and this can be everything. And again, this is why I teach so much on like these concepts, because I want to teach on things that are universal that can be extrapolated to any area of life. Because when we get these things right in one area and we see that they're effective and we extrapolate those and put those into our relationship, that we start operating in a way that we believe that we are, you know, how we intend to be rather than how we perceive ourselves, we begin acting that way. And unfortunately, people miss the mark and realize that, again, there are seasons for a reason. Now, obviously, you know, we live in Florida, so the seasons are a little bit different down here. But, uh, you know, the the reality is, is that, um, you know, there are seasons for a purpose. And the thing of it is, our bodies are designed, uh, life is designed to be in an interval strategy, you know, meaning that there's high effort, low effort, rest, you know, and then exhaustive states at times based on what we need. And again, unfortunately, whenever people think, if you were to stop and think about seasons, the way that is, there's a time to sow, you know, there's a time to cultivate the garden. There's a time to reap. There's a time for harvest, you know, all this different stuff. People are constantly trying to like sow and harvest at the same time over and over (laughs) nonstop. And then they wonder like, why, you know, like, Hey, you're, you're abusing your land, you know, metaphorically speaking, it's the same thing with your body. And it's like, People, you know, trying to work out constantly, trying to exhaust themselves in those ways. Um, There's one more thing that I teach on um, with stress. And I teach like, again, the right amount of stress on your hands will callus up and prevent you from getting blisters. Too much stress and you blister and you will never callus and you won't be able to work at all. Same thing, a little bit of sun exposure, you get tan. You know, sun is still a stressor. When you get too much sun, you blister, you burn. This is the same thing with working out. You work out, you grow, that you get fit. You work out excessively based on scarcity, fear, you know, lack, et cetera. You actually go into catabolic state. You break down muscle. You get sick. Your immune system weakens. Our bodies are designed to be an interval status on everything that we do. So again, it ebbs and flows. You rest, you work, you rest, you work. And that is what gets so much better results. And uh, the high achievers that I've worked with that see that they have that balance. And it's so cool. They're like, man, it's so cool that I work out so much less. I, I work less. I focus on my family more and I'm, I'm leaner. I make more, I feel better. All of these things are happening. Yeah. Cause your life is in balance. That's the beauty. <clears throat> yes. Balance is so important. I love those metaphors that you shared. I was cracking up about the land one. That was really yeah, good. <laughs> I, yeah. They just pop in my head. So I'm like, yeah, there, there's one. <laughs> so um, what would you say to the people who see, so say I, say somebody is going to the gym and they see all these like super ripped women, men, Mm -hmm. and they see them up in the gym twice a day, Mm -hmm. every day, seven days a week. Like, can we expose Mm -hmm. some stuff about like, you know how, cause I'm sure they're like, well, these people are doing it and they're really Mm -hmm. fit, you know, like what, what's going on there? Yeah. So fortunately, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, so fortunately I see less of that. Unfortunately it still happens. Um, and I believe that again, there, you can have a, <clears throat> a good workout and you can have a hard workout. Um, I'm sorry, you can have a, uh, a long workout or you can have a hard workout. You can't have both. And mm-hmm. the, the reality is, is that most of those people that you're seeing in that grade of shape, <clears throat> they're living life to such an obsession that they're doing this and they're using other substances and they're living life in such a way that is not necessarily repeatable by the average person. Um, and they're doing these things, but what you're seeing is their bodies are recovering in a different way because of other enhancements and so on and so forth, or they're just everything else in their life is falling to pieces, which is usually what I see. Unfortunately, um, I work with a lot of people that I've seen <clears throat> in helping them to recover from some of those obsessive and excessive tendencies. And these people are, are not in shape because of those tactics. They're in shape in spite of them. And the reality is, is that sometimes genetics plays a role. Sometimes it's consistency, so on and so forth. And the fact that they're living all of their lives, focusing on this obsession and unfortunately they're on the brink. It's kind of like a, uh, you know, a really rusty old bridge, like, yeah, it works. You can get across it, but at any point in time, this thing's going to break, you know, that's the life that they're living. 
And I hate to yeah. say that, but yeah. the reality is that that's what they're, they're doing every single day. So these are not people to emulate. They're, these are not people that are, you know, that are high achievers that are in balance. These are people that are unfortunately are obsessively trying to fill a void that's not fillable in this manner externally. So yeah, so don't, don't emulate those. <laughs> that's really good insight. Um, this, the, the next thing that I want to touch on, which I see so, so much. And I know when I really was struggling with my eating disorder, I had this a lot. It was like, I ate a bar of chocolate last night. And now my mind's like, you're going to get fat. You ate chocolate. It has sugar. Or like, I skip a day at the gym. I'm like, it's all, you know, and I hear this a lot too. It's like, but I ate pizza and I missed two days. So now I'm getting fat. And of course, like a lot of the people here know the power of the mind, but what would you say about this? Like, how can we not let bad days affect our progress? Yeah. So a couple of different things. This is, this is such a, a big topic um, specifically regarding um, fitness. Since you mentioned that specific yeah. area, the thing that people have to keep in mind is that there are a lot of myths and misnomers. And unfortunately, most of those emotional thoughts, what we call ruminating thoughts, those are going to be popped in based on emotions and, and thoughts of scarcity and fear. There's not going to be any factual or scientific evidence of any of those things. It's going to be an amalgamation of all of these pop culture science references that they've gotten and ads and so on and so forth. So the very first thing is to call those things out, to recognize that those voices are not based on fact, reality. They're not even based on any expert's opinion. Um, these things are based on just an amalgamation of just garbage that's out there. So first thing is address those things and call those things out in your head. These, these thoughts are garbage. Second thing is that I let people know when you are worried about, you know, what you're consuming and what's bad and what's good, I always let people know there's no such thing as a good food versus a bad food. There's foods that are more nutrient dense and foods that are less nutrient dense. Is wine or beer bad for you? Not at all. If you drink it in excess, you're going to suffer some symptoms. Is a candy bar or ice cream bad for you because it has sugar? Not at all. Eat it in excess. You're going to have some problems, but likewise, kale is good for you. Eat that in excess and you're going to have all, all sorts of digestive issues. Anything in excess is going to lead to that. Yeah. So the first thing is to understand that there's no such thing as bad foods versus good foods. There's moderation, there's, you know, limitations, there's boundaries. And most of us, again, we've, it's kind of like that. If some is good, more must be better. We think that strictness and rigidness is the way to get the results. And we don't let ourselves get breaks. A lot of this is based on shame because we have these shaming scenarios over and over in our head that say, you're going to this way. And, you know, you already don't like yourself. Now you're going to get fat. What do you think? You know, our kid, oh my God, nobody's going to love you. And that's where these things come from. So there's a fear associated with this of, I don't want to feel this abandonment that I feel that I associate with being overweight or associated with not being wealthy or not being X, Y, and Z. So I chase these, these things of rigidness in order to feel a sense of control to undo this, these shaming scenarios, but they only lead to more shaming scenarios. Mm. And so the best thing here is, again, whenever you've got like, you know, the voices that are telling you these things is to understand the facts. Number one is like, if you don't know what those facts are, that you're weren't, you know, like you're trying to create a doctrine based on like um, these amalgamations of things that don't really make sense. And you're using, and you're shaming yourself for not following those things. Like who said you can't have a cookie? Who also said that like, if you did this, that that's bad. First identify, where was the source? Like challenge it, challenge those thoughts. Because People tell you like, don't think that, think happy thoughts, think good thoughts, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you challenge your thoughts? Yeah. Challenge those thoughts that are negative. They're telling you that and ask, you know what? If that were a criticism from somebody else, I would want to know, is that accurate? Do I need to give this any validation? Look it up. If you don't know, then look at a coach, look at a mentor, find a book, do something and find out if those facts are even worth thinking. But usually they're not. And this is where a lot of times I will teach the difference of energy balance, which is again, consuming the right amount of intake or energy or calories for what your body needs. And most people have no clue, none at all, what their body needs or how many calories they burn. People have just associated negative words with calories. If you were to replace the word calories with energy or fuel, you throughout the day need a certain amount of energy in order to keep the lights on, to be able to exercise, to be able to think creatively and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, how you fill that energy is up to you. What I teach is, again, a certain percentage of protein, fats, and carbs so that we get the right levels of serotonin so that your muscle heals and so on and so forth. I also teach an 80-20 rule, which gives flexibility. So 80% of the time, you're going to focus on those good, clean, holistic, true foods that are less processed. 20% of the time, give yourself, just like you give yourself a rest, 20% of the time, give yourself a cookie 
you know, this isn't on a weekly basis. This is daily. 20% of your calories can come from those fun foods. And what this is doing is it's giving you an understanding that there are no bad calories and good calories. There are the right amount of calories for my needs to keep me at my best. And I can have moderation. And when people like me who are excessive go, how do I have moderation? Well, you set little boundaries, little rules. Okay. The 80, 20 rule. So am I within 20% or 80% like I need to be? Yes. No guilt, no shame. I still get to lose body fat and I feel better. Healthy cycle based on facts instead of pop culture references on videos from people trying to sell us things. So does that make sense? Yeah, that was very good. Um, one thing I want to share is not everything you read is true. <laughs> and there is so much very misinformation much so. out there, not just in the life and fitness or health and fitness world, but in mm. the spiritual world and healing world and everywhere. And I wow. really invite you guys to not just read like mindlessly, but to like feel into does the, is this true for me? Of course, like you can look at a research article and see where the sources came from. If they're from like a really reputable medical journal or whatever. Um, but there, we have to keep in mind that especially around food, there is a lot oh, of yeah. money under the table that gets paid. You know, we hear about this around dairy and stuff like that, where there's either fear placed on foods or there's like positivity placed on certain foods. So you got to really be mindful with anything, of course, like which information is true. And I want to come back to what you said around that process, because Ooh. it's a powerful process of, um, for, for not just our health, but for our business, which is like identifying what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Where did this come from? And what do I choose to feel and think instead? And this is something that I do throughout every day. If something doesn't feel good, I'm not getting the result I'm wanting. I look at what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Where did this come from? Did somebody tell me this? Was it my mom who right. said like, cookies make you fat because my mom had an eating disorder, which I didn't even know as a child. Um, and then choosing what I want instead. And this is where kind of, you were talking about like our minds and our, I'm not like a science person, but like our, we start to rewire on a yeah, cellular completely. level and yeah. we are mm -hmm. that powerful, you guys. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And that's the thing is um, that process is uh, hyperplasticity and it's, it's so cool where we like, we rewire the synapses within the brain and uh, those synapses are kind of like um, almost like um, when you've walked through the grass a bunch on a trail and it begins to erode, <clears throat> those synapses become like that. And so when they're wired together, they stay together. And so when we begin to, um, or I'm sorry, when they're wired together, they begin to fire together constantly. So we have a, a trigger because mm -hmm. we've created that path. And now every time that trigger happens, that path automatically fires. So it goes point A to point B. And this is where we, when we begin to challenge thoughts and challenge where they came from and then become intentional, this is, again, 45% of our day is unconscious. We're walking through the day automatically, which is where, again, like we're basically in a transient state. So when yeah. you're driving and you don't realize how you got there, but you got there, you are in that automatic state. And this is how 45% of our days are. When you've trained yourself to have a habit that it's 5 p.m., you get home, you don't know, you haven't identified if you're hungry, bored, lonely, sad, tired, whatever. All you know is it's 5 p.m. and it's time to grab cookies. So you grab cookies. Now that's not to say the cookies are bad, but if it's a habit and it's not leading to or serving your greater, your greater purpose, it yeah. is bad, especially if it's not intentional. When mm -hmm. I grab a cookie now, it's very intentional. I've calculated, okay, I've got this. I know it's this many. Like I, I know that I want it. <laughs> and I teach people to be intentional. Even again, same thing in your business. When you're walking through life and you're just going automatic, these, being automatic is great for things like driving and great for things like getting things done and typing and so on and so forth, playing piano. These are all subconscious techniques. But when people are making very key decisions, such as how much food to eat, how, is this excessive alcohol, you know, who to be with, what business to start up, all these different things. When you're doing this automatically or unconsciously, like you're driving, there's no intentionality there whatsoever. And then we're usually so just, uh, you know, uh, just ridiculously overwhelmed with whatever consequence we got. Like, how did we do this? What happened? There was no intentionality. We didn't give it any thought. We allowed it to just be as if we're driving while changing the channel on the, on the radio. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so do you teach on like our thoughts and our energy and our feelings create our reality or what do you think <clears throat> about all that? Yeah. So I believe that again, basically, you know, we, we've got a programming essentially. And so, you know, we, we have an identity that's built on that. So 
we have like an identity that we believe to be true about ourselves, which causes a thought about ourselves. And that thought is going to lead to um, an overall like global belief. That global belief leads to um, actions. Those actions get results, which either solidify what we believe to be true about ourselves, mm-hmm. or we challenge that thought, in which case we can change the action or we can change our beliefs about ourselves. So yeah, what we believe to be true about ourselves or who we are is going to absolutely affect all of our decisions unless we challenge one or both of those completely. <clears throat> I love how you talk about it on a more like scientific, like factual type basis. Cause I, you know, the way that I explain it is the energy we hold, our feelings that we hold and the thoughts that we have, like, yes, who we believe we are is going to have us take the actions, but everything we are inside is reflected outside of us. Um, And so I like to take everything that I see, like even in my relationship, it's like, okay, Like, yeah, he was the trigger. He pissed me off. But like, what is it showing me inside of me? Yeah, introspection for sure. Yeah, that's, you know, (laughs) and if you've got a good mindset when you introspect, it can be such a great thing where you truly like go in a meditative state that you're trying to be within um, and you're trying to really examine, you know, how like, is this true of me? Is this what I want? Is this, did I, was I intentional about this? so and so forth, that can be great. Unfortunately, sometimes people will introspect, but they do it with those shaming spirals where it's like, they go inside and they start going like, you know, introspecting of like, he said this and he, he left me because of X, Y, and Z and they go in those things. So be sure when you do that, that you're introspecting and you're actually searching and that you're not creating stories, search and find what story that is within you too, you know? So that's been my experience at least. That is a good tip. Yeah. You don't want to go in and like ruminate and beat yourself right, up. Right. It's more of like yeah. what inside of me had me feel angry, that's identifying where it came from, yes, moving it out so that you yeah. have less anger <laughs> and then moving forward. Yeah, that's it. So that's the, it, the, the phrasing or the questioning. So instead of the, like, she just posed here guys that again, what caused this, where did this come from where you might have in the past said, why am I like this? When you ask yourself a question, ask your subconscious a question, why am I like this? It's going to retrieve data based on, again, the amalgamation of what it's put together based on shaming, based on other people's beliefs, your perception. So don't ask, why am I like this? Ask what caused this or where did this come from? Is this true of what I want? When you ask yourself bad questions or ask you know, of yourself, your subconscious will automatically retrieve what it deems and it's going to give you a bad answer of like, of course you're like that you gained 30 pounds in the last year, who would love you? That's when you ask yourself, why am I like this? Why did he do this? Instead, like she posed, ask yourself, you know, why did this happen? What caused this? Did I, you know, was I in a bad place? Did I make any decisions that I would have made better in a Mm -hmm. better, you know, light or in a better state of mind? And that's, that's something that you can change and allows you to go forward in a different path next time. Yes. I love it. So, um, what is something that, you want to leave people with like something, maybe actionable steps or just a message that they can go home with? Um, I think that I would say that one of my biggest keys is like, again, challenge your, your negative thoughts first and foremost, you know, find out where they're coming from and then ask yourself how many different things when you're not getting the results that you want in life and fitness and your goals, ask yourself which areas you're being less intentional than what you would want your kids to be or your employees to be, or so on and so forth. And see if you can, you know, I, I teach this thing on misalignment, find out what your actions um, are and see, make sure that those actions are in alignment with your goals and your beliefs. When you do this, this is all an introspective state. There's power here because it's going to lead to either a certain level of fulfillment and satisfaction of, wow, I've done really well, or it's gonna to lead to dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction is not a, a bad place. I've made some amazing business choices because of dissatisfaction. I've made some awesome transitions because of dissatisfaction. That's where change happens when you truly decide, not when you feel pain and just want to get rid of the pain, but when you determine internally that there is dissatisfaction, that this is out of alignment for what's best for you. Mm -hmm. This is powerful. You can make decisions here and you'll do it intentionally. Cool. I love that. Yeah. Angela said, okay, wait, Jamie says, good afternoon. Triggers are my favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Triggers are great for bringing up stuff and growing and Angela's steps would be great. Cool. So guys, I want to give you an opportunity to ask Lance any questions um, about this, or maybe something that you're specifically curious about. And if not, like if we don't get you while we're still live, then um, I will have Lance share with you where you can 
find him. Um, you can, I'm sure private message you, but you can share where they can find you and, um, get in touch with you to follow you. Yeah. Um, completely. So yeah, you guys, and I'm actually too, I'm sending you this right now. Um, Maddie, the, um, this is a, you can share this. I built this, um, fat loss assessment. It's a, um, it's basically oh, cool. a weight loss quiz to give everybody, um, a good concept of where to start. So most people go, Lance, I eat this and I do this basically diagnose me. And I built an entire fat loss assessment basically, because most people struggle with these areas and they have no clue whether their mindset is the problem, whether they're um, habits, their, you know, metabolism, et cetera. So I built a quiz that basically is going to outline which of the five components, like they might need to focus on more. So I sent you that. So feel free to share that you guys can get access to it. Um, and then you asked me, um, how to find me. Is that what you did? The last question? Yeah, I share I with them where they can find you. Yeah. Um, I just post posted the link. So anybody, if you want that it's in the comments of the video. Awesome. Yeah. So you guys can find me um, on Instagram um, at lance.caron, C-A-R-O-N. Um, you can find me on YouTube. I just am starting to, uh, to put out content again, but um, also in my, um, my um, nutrition and fitness group called Elevate Your Body Confidence. Um, so those are the three best places to, uh, to find stuff. And the reason I mention those places is because that's where I give the most content. Um, I always want people to watch and absorb my content and um, to kind of go through a little bit of an indoctrination process before even thinking about working with me. So that, that way, what I don't want somebody to do is to be like, oh, this sounds great. I want to work with them. Watch some stuff, get some free things, try and get some, like really get some impact. I want to, I deliver so much stuff for people that's free. And I've had so many people like get in better shape and actually start making some major changes just from watching videos. So absorb my free stuff, do some things like that and uh, just see what you guys can learn, see what processes begin to change. And if you guys have any questions, you know, uh, comment, I, I literally would go through, I personally comment on everything. I respond to messages and all that stuff. I answer questions and I will, or I will create content inside of my, uh, my group for anybody that has questions too. Cool. Yay. Well, okay. So guys, I, posted the fat loss quiz. I posted the Instagram handle and his group. So definitely check those out. He has a lot of valuable information. I was like looking at all of it before our interview. It's really good. And Lance, I want to just thank you again for being here. It was so good. This was really valuable. And, um, I'm so glad that everybody got to hear from you. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's, it's been awesome. I hope I didn't talk too much, but it's been such a, a blast, you know, kind of getting on here and being able to share this and kind of having it like you know, in a good, like, uh, conversation style. So this is a really blast. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you back and yeah. guys have a good day and we'll see you next week. We're going to be here with Matt Cardone. You guys have very similar last names, yes, <laughs> but definitely. we're going to, he's a meditation teacher and we're going to be talking about elevating your meditation practice. Nice. So we'll see you next week. Awesome. See you guys. <laughs>